order this computer. Okay, we are all set. So I'll turn it over to Linda. Mm -hmm. Why isn't that going down? You're here in Zoom, not in PowerPoint. Okay, my goal today is to get you better acquainted with the wonderful world of herbs. Uh, so we're going to talk about some general growing conditions and care of the herbs. And then we're going to discuss a few annual herbs and a few perennial herbs and harvesting and preserving the herbs. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what the definition of an herb is for our presentation today. And if you were to look it up in Webster Dictionary, there's two. We're going to go with the second one, a plant or plant parts valued for medicinal, aromatic, or culinary purposes. Today, we're going to be talking mostly about culinary, some aromatic, and I leave the medicinal purposes up to you to explore on your own. Then we're going to take it a little uh, farther and we're going to see what the difference is between a spice and an herb. An herb comes from the root stem, seed, flower, or bark of a plant or tree like cinnamon, whereas your herb comes from the green leafy part of the plant uh, like basil. That's what we're going to be talking about today. However, some plants can be both an herb and a spice, and I will have some of those noted for you. Uh, like cilantro, a leaf is the herb, okay, and the seed is uh, the spice, and we all know that is coriander. So the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to plan the herb garden. So we're going to have to decide a location, types of herbs we want to plant, intended uses of the herbs we're going to grow, and how we're, grow, how we're going to grow or start our herbs. Let's start with location first, and we have to consider if we're going to plant them outside or inside. And if they're outside, are we going to plant them in the ground or container or raised bed? Um, there are some um, advantages of planting uh, outside. Uh, I think you get a higher yield outside, you have more flavor from these herbs outside, and you have more space. However, inside, um, you have advantages of easy access, uh, no weeding, that's my favorite, and now uh, you have a year-round growing season. But wherever you grow these plants, you're going to need to have proper amount of sunlight, water, adequate drainage, adequate space, and good quality soil. So if we start with outside, uh, they need about six to eight hours of sun. So make sure you read that tag on your established plant if you're buying an established plant, or you read your seed packet. They're going to need a proper uh, amount of, of water too. Let's go back to sunlight though for a second. Uh, some of these are happy with uh, maybe four to five minimum hours of sunlight. Um, that would be like maybe your mints and even parsley. And then there are other ones like your tender perennials. Uh, they don't like that hot afternoon sun that we have, especially here in Georgia and especially lately. So uh, they need, need to be moved out of that hot afternoon sun, like your basil and your cilantro. Again, proper amount of water and convenient water source. Um, you have to water them, so make sure you have a water source close by. I think water is probably the one uh, care that maybe uh, varies the most between these herbs. Uh, some are really drought tolerant, like uh, thyme and sage. Uh, you can't kill sage too much, only if you overwater it. Um, and others like basil and mint, they like to be kept uh, moist. So I like to tell people to keep their soil moderately damp to uh, semi-dry, because I'm going to tell you right now, you are more likely to kill your herb plants from overwatering them than from underwatering them. These herb plants also do not like their feet wet, so make sure you have adequate drainage. If you are planting in an existing garden, you've already done your homework and probably added some compost if you needed. But if you're making a new herb garden, uh, you might have to uh, make some amendments to your soil so you have adequate drainage. If you're planting in a container, you have to have holes in the bottom of that container. Um, otherwise, you're just going to, uh, that soil is going to compact uh, and you are not going to get any air and they're just going to, um, they're just going to die on you. You're going to have wet feet. Uh, you also need uh, adequate space. Another reason why you got to read your seed packet or the uh, little tag that comes with your plant, um, it tells you the spacing. Uh, if you start out with a 14 inch pot, 
three nice little herbs like maybe basil and uh, maybe a um, cilantro and maybe a chives. Uh, they'll fit pretty good in that three inch pot. But if you were to put in a, um, let's say um, a one like borage, we're gonna talk about borage, that plant can get really, really big. It can get two to three feet wide and high. That's not a good one to put in a, a, in a pot and you need adequate space for that. Mint, mint is another one. If you put that in a 14 inch pot, it will take that whole 14 inch pot up all by itself. Uh, you're also gonna need good quality soil. If you are planting in a container, you need to have uh, either potting soil or potting mix. I like potting mix better than potting soil. Uh, people use them interchangeably, but they are different. Uh, potting soil has soil. Uh, potting mix uh, mostly has uh, actually, it has uh, natural ingredients like your perlite and uh, peat moss. And that like creates a light, uh, airy texture, well-drained texture for the herbs, and that's kind of what they like. Um, I also think it's more sterile, but both of them usually come with some nutrients in them. So uh, that's a good thing too. You do not want to use garden soil. People always want to use garden soil in their pots. It is not good to use garden soil in your pots. It's too dense. It will not, uh, especially after heavy rain, it will not drain out well and it will really become compacted. There will be no air going to those roots and your roots and that plant is gonna die on you. Um, I also like to tell people that a well-prepped garden soil goes a long way. So if you're using soil that's tired and you don't have any nutrients in it, you're not gonna be very successful. So whether you're planting in a new area or you're planting in an existing vegetable or flower area for these herbs, do yourself a favor, save yourself a lot of headaches and get yourself a, a soil test. A soil test you can, uh, is not hard to do. You can call the extension office and they will give you um, uh, directions over the phone or you can go to their website and they have directions on the website too. Um, it, quickly, you take eight to 10 scoops of soil, dig down about six to 10 inches deep, You know, get a good slice of that uh, soil mix it up in a pail, and then you can go inside and get like an eight ounce plastic cup, put it in there, get your keys, drive down to the extension office, and there you're gonna see these soil sample bags. You can see a picture over here on the side. Uh, they cost $10 now to get a sample, and someone will come out and help you, and they'll ask you what you're gonna be using this uh, soil garden for. You'll tell them an herb garden. They'll send it out to be analyzed, and in a few days, uh, they ask you for your email. Now you get an email and uh, they will let you know the appropriate amendments and nutrients and they will tell you the pH of your soil. People don't spend enough time um, finding out what the pH of their soil is. pH is uh, very important and it's the measure of acidity in your soil. Different plants like different acidity and uh, that helps them use the nutrients uh, in the soil to the best of that plant's ability. Our herbs, like a slightly acidic soil of six to seven, where our soil here is a pH of 4.5 to 5.5. So we're gonna to have to add a soil modifier. We're gonna to have to raise the pH. So we're gonna to have to ask, uh, use uh, lime. Um, I'm not gonna get into that right now, but you can call the extension office uh, and your report will also tell you uh, how much lime to use uh, for your area but you can call them too and they'll those different types of lime that you can use uh, and the best time to uh, put lime in your soil. Let's go inside for a second and uh, go to the two most things I think are important if you're growing them inside and that is light and space. Um, like we said, these herbs need six to eight hours of light to grow. So probably self-facing window is probably your best bet to uh, grow these herbs. Um, if you are just starting uh, to grow herbs inside, a thyme and mint and uh, even, yes, rosemary is a good one for indirect light. If you do not have a good window to put it in or you want it in your kitchen and you don't have any window at all, you need to get yourself some grow lights. Grow lights are not big and expensive anymore. Um, there's some that clip on to a, a table. There are some that go on your <clears throat> counter and they don't take up a lot of room and you can get at least three little pots underneath there. And I even found one about a month ago on Amazon and it wasn't very expensive and it's for an individual pot. And it even comes with its own timer. 
So uh, you can't uh, go wrong. I do want to let you know that for every hour outside that that plant requires sunlight, you're going to need two hours underneath that grow light. So an average for herbs would be like 14 hours. Uh, then uh, also space. Some of these uh, herbs like to have, they have large root systems and they prefer being in the ground rather than uh, in a pot. Not to say that you can't grow them inside in a pot. Uh, people like to grow um, uh, rosemary in a pot and find, in fact, all the time they will buy a little plant and try to grow it inside and it will do well for a couple months, but then it's gonna get root bound. And you're either gonna to have to put it in a bigger pot, okay? And you might not have room for that, or you're gonna to have to put it outside. Some of the ones that I think are really good inside are basil. Chives is a great one for inside. Uh, it's pretty forgiving, uh, if you, especially if you're a beginner on light and water requirements. And so chives is a good one, uh, along with uh, oregano and parsley. Uh, now that we've discussed uh, some of the uh, verses inside and outside and container needs and outside needs, I like to tell beginners to start with a 14 inch pot. Uh, why do I say this? Well, first of all, um, it is um, a small scale. You're starting on a small scale. Um, lots of times we try to just dive into things and then uh, we, we get overwhelmed. We want you, I want you to learn how to grow herbs and all the benefits and things you can do with herbs. And so I want you to be successful. So if you start with a 14 inch pot, like I said before, you can get three uh, plants in there and just concentrate on three plants. And when you have some, some success underneath your belt, you will want to go and try some other herbs. Um, so, uh, it, and then there's other advantages too. Uh, you can move that pot to more advantageous light. Uh, say you planted some basil in the beginning of the year and now it's in that hot, hot sun that in the afternoon that we've been getting and it doesn't like it, you can move it out of that area into a more shaded area. Uh, also, you can move it, now these pots, when it's been like 99 and uh, out there, we have to at least water a couple times a day our pots. So you could maybe move it closer to your water source um, than it was before. Uh, I also, my favorite again is there's no weeds. And then you will have good drainage because you will have remembered to put drainage holes in there and you will have good soil. So you will have success in uh, growing these herbs. Let's talk about now some of the different types of herbs, just like flowers, annual, biannual, and perennial. Why do we want to know this? Well, probably maybe because if we're putting them in our uh, garden area or flower garden area, we want to put the perennials uh, with perennials or in our vegetable garden uh, away from our annuals. Uh, we're going to be pulling out our tomato plants at the end of the year, so we don't want to pull our perennials out at the same time. Um, so again, an annual herb has a complete cycle of one year, seed to plant the seed one year. Biannual reaches its growth maturity in the second year, and then it will bolt and go to seed, and then it just like poops out on you a little bit. A perennial herb lives year after year and dies back in the winter and comes back from that same root system in the spring. Some annuals and biannuals, basil, y'all know basil. Parsley, technically a biannual. Uh, leaf cel a celery, uh, technically a biannual, but those two are always grown as an annual. Uh, we're going to talk about that. And borage uh, is an annual. Um, I noted here that uh, cilantro, as some people call it coriander, uh, repels mosquitoes uh, from that strong scent. And so maybe you want to put a pot of this on your patio or your deck. Culinary herbs are perennial herbs. Most all of our cooking herbs that we think of uh, are perennial herbs. Uh, oregano, thyme, sage, rosemary. Um, I also put on here, rosemary repels mosquitoes. And for all you do-it-yourselfers out there, if you were to um, Google how to make a homemade insect uh, mosquito repellent, uh, more times uh, than not, you're gonna find rosemary as an ingredient. So what are some of the benefits of growing herbs? Well, herbs are some of the easiest plants to grow. They tolerate a lot of different soils and they don't have a lot of insects or diseases that bother them. They beautify our gardens. They add beauty to our garden. They're good for you. They add flavor to our foods. 
Uh, they save us money like anything else if we can grow it now. I don't know about you, but every time I go to that grocery store, I wonder if I have to take a loan out lately. They are educational, therapeutic, and they're fun. They also make great companion plants as they repel insects. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And they make great pollinators. I think people sometimes, if they have pollinator gardens, they don't add herbs, they should. They are great pollinators. They attract bees, butterflies, and even hummingbirds. We're gonna talk about borage in a little while. Uh, hummingbirds love borage, and they also love <clears throat> pineapple mint. Uh, they love that red flower on that pineapple mint. So how are we going to use our herbs? Well, most of us are probably going to use them for culinary purposes um, as cooking and preserving. Uh, there's so many ways to use them in cooking. You can make oils, you can make butters, you can make so, um, salts, uh, you can even make jams and jellies. Uh, you can make mock cocktails, that's a big thing now. Breads, um, um, just a plethora of things that you can make uh, with culinary herbs. Um, a few weeks ago, when the strawberries were so good this year, I had a bunch of strawberries and I had a bunch of basil that needed to be harvested really bad. So I made a batch of um, strawberry um, basil jam, and I'm going to give it for Christmas presents. It's nice and red and it has some green in it. So um, all those things you can do with, um, with your herbs. In the flower garden, uh, they make great accent colors. Uh, for instance, uh, a great substitute for coleus is your red basil or your purple basil. There is, a red ba there is a red ruben and a red ruffles that looks great in your, in your flower pots. Also, they make great fillers for your bouquets. They make great bouquets just on their own, just for the fragrance. Uh, basil, um, some of these basils are, uh, smell so uh, enticing and uh, people will do this for rosemary also. They will cut rosemary and bring it in their house uh, and uh, I, I do that, and my cats don't eat my rosemary. Sometimes they'll eat my uh, flowers, though. When I had a flower farm in Western New York, I sold what was called herbal bouquets, and they were made out of zinnias and basil, and my customers loved them. So um, another thing to think about doing with your herbs. They also make great companion plants. Now, companion planting is based on a theory. It's, uh, it's backed by significant evidence. It doesn't really have any scientific evidence. That planting different plant, plants in close proximity to each other is going to benefit uh, that plant. So um, that's becoming very popular now. I mean, you can Google, well, you can Google anything, but if you were to Google companion plants and herbs, you'd find charts and charts of information on it. So just an example here. Let's use chives. Chives has that pretty lavender to pink flower and it would look nice in your garden. So why not put it around your roses too, but it could, because it is said to reduce black spot and Japanese beetle. In your vegetable garden, it's the same. Strong fragrance of herbs can keep away some pest. Um, uh, for instance, we just talked about uh, um, your rosemary and uh, your cilantro for doing mosquitoes. Um, chives is a great one for it, its strong odor too, and it keeps your little aphids away when that carrot plant's starting to develop and just starting to grow. Lots of times it will have aphids, and it's said to uh, uh, keep the aphids away. I don't think you can have a tomato plant without basil. They're like soulmates. So whether you're planting it in a garden or in a raised bed or even in a pot, you can see over here uh, where my friend planted a uh, tomato plant and she has the basil around the bottom. Um, it's said that there's a chemical component in basil that keeps that hornworm away. So that's another reason uh, to plant basil uh, uh, in your garden. Again, they're great pollinators. Uh, these bees, honeybees, love, love herbs. They go gaga over herbs when they're in flower. So plant some in your pollinator garden if you haven't already. They can be both a good pollinator and they can also be a good compatible plant. Like dill will attract honeybees, but it always uh, it also discourages aphids and cabbage loopers. How are we going to get our plants? Are we going to grow them from seed? Are we going to have established plant? We're going to talk about some divisions and some other things in a minute. But if you're going to buy an established plant, you can get them at your no local nurseries. Now you can even get a lot of your herbs uh, from seed catalogs as start as plants, so they'll ship them to you, especially the ones 
that you can't see, uh, don't find uh, so much in, the, uh, in your local nurseries. You can also get them at plant sales like the Master Gardener plant sale. And yes, even at your gro uh, grocery produce section. Um, you will always find basil almost all year round in your produce section, but I've gotten thyme, cilantro, rosemary, chives. They're all in there and you can bring them home and grow them in your kitchen. I, I think I got a, a basil plant maybe April last uh, this year and had it in the house for, oh, I don't know, till the end of May. And then I took it outside and now it's... Uh, growing really got huge outside and now I'm using it again. So I had it outside, took it up uh, inside and then I took it outside and I'm still using it. If we are planting from seed, uh, it gives you a head start on your growing season and uh, you have more variety if you plant from seed. Uh, if you are planting from seed, make sure you read the directions on the back of that seed packet. It is gonna tell you everything that you need to know to uh, succeed in planting and, and uh, germinating that seed. It is going to tell you when to start it inside, when to start it outside. It's going to tell you uh, spacing requirements, lighting requirements, water requirements. So make sure you read the directions. It's also going to tell you your zone hardiness. That's an important thing because lots of times I think people see a plant or and they think, oh my God, I got to have that plant so beautiful or I want to try that, it smells so good. And it is not uh, zone hardy here. Maybe it's eight or 10. We have to be seven or lower uh, for it to be hardy in this area. So make sure you check your, uh, your tag if you buy an established plant or your seed packet. If you are also planning uh, starting seed inside, um, I like to do hydroponics uh, and uh, I have great success with that. And that is great for beginners because you're gonna really succeed. Uh, these, they have a lot of them out there now, a lot of different systems. Um, Aero Garden, I like Aero Garden uh, because you can, it's very um, compact. Uh, you can get a machine that has maybe only four plants. You can grow up six, eight. Uh, and uh, the machine uh, will come with its own grow light and it goes on and off. You will just set it until you're growing for herbs and it sets it itself, goes on, off. It has a, a water reservoir. And if the water gets low, the machine will tell you when to add water. And it comes with its own um, water soluble fertilizer, it tells you how much to use. And the machine also tells you when to put it in your water uh, next time. So you might wanna check those out. Let's start now for talk about division. That is a one great one to do with your perennial herbs, especially chives. Chives is one I think everybody knows and benefits from division also. Um, you dig up the plant root and you cut it up or break it up into several pieces. I say the best time of the year is to do it in the fall, especially chives, but a lot of these you can do in the spring or the fall. Um, you can use your divisions and you can bring them inside and grow them in, indoors in the winter just make sure that they're not in that garden soil. Repot them in another pot and use a potting soil or potting mix. Uh, oregano and marjoram are also great for this. Uh, stem segment uh, cuttings. Uh, that's uh, another one we use for rosemary a lot and uh, lavender. Uh, rosemary is painful to grow from seed, believe me. It can take up to a month if you're lucky. And then it uh, needs a lot of heat uh, to germinate. And also the germination rate is very low, like at 30%. So most people buy an established plant or they make cuttings. So you can make a cutting three to six, I say more like six inches, uh, leave about five to six leaves on that stem. When you cut it, you cut it in a, at an angle just below a leaf node. The leaf node is what's going to go into that soil. And that's what the root's going to come from there. You're going to dip it in some rooting compound if you want, you don't have to but it helps a little bit. And you will plant it about two inches deep or so. Uh, you're gonna remove the bottom portion of those leaves, uh, no leaves uh, below the soil. And we want the plant to concentrate on making new roots instead of thinking about its leaves. Uh, so uh, we'll put it in a four inch pot. Uh, we can cover it loosely with a plastic bag and make a little mini greenhouse. If you're doing rosemary though, and you see that that bag is uh, starting to re, uh, have too much moisture, remove it because rosemary is prone to powdery mildew. That is one thing that uh, rosemary can get. 
I'll keep it out of direct uh, sunlight. It's just a little baby and we want it to uh, grow. We don't want to bake it. In a few weeks, you should be able to tug on it a little bit and you should see some resistance and you know that those roots have uh, taken hold. You can also make cuttings, uh, especially, you can do this with rosemary also and, and it, before you put it into the soil, you can do it this way too. But we usually mostly do this with our soft stemmed herbs or um, our leafy green herbs like mint, basil, and oregano. Uh, you can see over here on the side, uh, we have two containers, oregano and mint. Uh, and uh, we want to have, uh, I'd say, uh, roots about two inches long. And you need about uh, 10 to uh, 15 roots on those stems before you uh, put them in the soil. Let's talk about some varieties now, and we're quickly going to start with some annuals. Basil, probably the most popular, uh, sweet basil, and the variety is Genovese. Uh, that's what you see mostly in your stores, uh, nurseries, uh, when, you, when you see the plants. It is a Mediterranean herb that likes to be kept moist and doesn't like that hot afternoon sun. We talked about that. It is one of the earliest known herbs. Uh, I put a little a few tidbits up here for you. Romans thought it caused insanity. And the Greeks thought in order to grow it, you had to swear at the seed. Now, my father taught me to talk nice to my seeds and plants, so maybe that's why they had a hard time. It is prone to downy mildew, but they have been working and working on this to have varieties that are very resistant, and now they do. I think Prospera series is one of those, uh, so you can research that. I like my citrus bagel, basils. Um, uh, most of you probably know about lemon, uh, but there is a lime. A lime is my favorite. Uh, the leaf is a little bit smaller, uh, but it smells uh, so, it just smells delightful. And uh, it smells like you just cut into a lime. So it's very nice in containers and very nice in uh, cup flowers. And you can make a bouquet all of its own. Um, you can see here, I made a theme uh, container and I have my citrus basil and I have some uh, citrus thyme. There's orange and lemon in there. Uh, some of the varieties of lemon basil that I like would be uh, sweet Danny, uh, lime basil. I only know of one, so lime basil. And uh, Mrs. Burns is a combination of lemon and lime. We talked about red Reuben being great in flower gardens and in our flower, and they look great in, in the vegetable garden too. You can see the, the blue arrow pointing to it. It's a very attractive plant. And it makes a great pink vinegar. Uh, I'm making some right now. It's not hard to do. Uh, takes a few weeks, uh, and you can, the longer you let it sit, the more basil flavor you get. Uh, you can even put a little garlic in there with you. Uh, but this is another thing that you can uh, make with your uh, basils. So you can even research that. It makes a unique little gift. Uh, I think uh, the one basil that people don't think, think about or know too much about is blue spice. It probably has the most heavy fragrance of all the basils. Looks great in a flower pot and garden and it pairs very well with uh, fruit. You can see here all the different varieties of basil I uh, grew. Uh, Thai basil is probably one you know. Uh, cinnamon basil you might not know. They're very similar. Uh, you can tell the difference in the leaf by the, by the leaf though. Uh, they are a great substitute. Cinnamon is a great substitute for Thai basil, however. Thai basil has more of a, a licorice uh, taste and cinnamon is a true cinnamon. But cinnamon basil uh, goes well with uh, fruit. It goes very well with uh, squash and uh, some of your plants like that. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of uses uh, for cinnamon basil. I wanted to mention glow basil. I like that for inside. Uh, that is very compact and you can shape it into this uh, little round ball. The leaves are very small. You don't even have to cut them. I think that's more spicy than most of your other uh, basils though. Let's talk about borage for a second. Uh, I think uh, people don't use borage like they, they, sh they should. I think it was used more in uh, times before, but the honeybees and beneficial insects uh, love borage. Um, <clears throat> uh, beneficial insects like your praying mantis and your um, predatory wasp, um, they love uh, borage. Um, in fact, uh, honeybee keepers, if you're a honeybee keeper and you don't have it tried borage, uh, you should. Uh, it is said to improve uh, your production. Uh, that's how much they love it. This plant also adds trace minerals to your uh, uh, to the soil. 
A lot of strawberry growers will, will grow uh, borage uh, because of its uh, beneficial insects that's drawn to it and the pollinators and the trace minerals that go into your soil. Um, so uh, although it does reseed itself a lot, the volunteers are not hard to pull out of the ground. And so since they add trace minerals, they're a good thing to throw into your compost pile. It has a pretty blue flower. Uh, it does come with a white flower also, but you don't find that one. So a nice thing you can do with the blue flower is if you're having people over for dinner or your girlfriends come over, you can put them in a, a water and uh, in the ice cubes and they make a nice little um, ice cube in, in your drinks, uh, like in lemonade or, or water or your mock cocktails. Everybody's using these mock cocktails now. So, uh, and the leaves can be uh, used and the flowers and they usually use them in teas and drinks. Cilantro, if you are, have uh, planted a salsa garden, uh, you got to have cilantro. Now, I found out that you either love this plant or hate this plant. So I did a little research and found out that some of us have a gene that makes it taste and smell soapy. And then uh, it also makes it taste like a dead bug. Well, what's a dead bug smell like? Well, I want to tell you, if I squish a stink bug, it smells like cilantro to me. But I don't really care. I still like cilantro. This plant prefers cool weather, contrary to what most people think. In the hot summer, it will bolt, it will wilt, and it will die on you. Okay, so it's good to plant this one in the beginning of your season or maybe at the end of the season when it's cooler, and you can do succession planting. Every few weeks, you will plant some of these, and you will have a longer growing season out of it. It also is grow, uh, good for microgreens. Uh, for all you people that grow microgreens out there, uh, cilantro and even basil is a good one uh, for uh, microgreens. So if you have some seed left over, uh, try it. Those little leaves taste just as bold and nice in that uh, as the uh, mature plant. If you don't know about microgreens, uh, that's one thing you should research. Uh, microgreens are very nutritious for you. They're easy to grow inside a great turnover rate in a, in a week to, uh, to two weeks, you're gonna have uh, these uh, like little microgreens that you can add to your salad and other things and they will save you money. Microgreens are very expensive in the store. Cutting celery, I like cutting celery, also known as Chinese or leaf celery. Uh, it is a good companion plant as it repels your cabbage white butterfly and it's a lot easier to grow than uh, regular standard celery. It is cut and come again. This plant loves, like a lot of our leafy green herbs, loves to be harvested. The more you harvest it, the more yield you're gonna get from it. Um, the caterpillar of, the, of black swallowtail loves this, so plant a little extra for them and you. And I like to use it in my winter flower pots with snapdragons. Uh, dill is also a good one. If you do a lot of canning, uh, like I do, you got to have dill. I don't have a lot of space, so I have to use some of the varieties uh, like Teddy and Fernley. If you can see where I'm growing it in a container over on the side there. Uh, but not only for canning, uh, it is also good with fish. It's good with uh, potatoes. Um, it, it's uh, carrots. A lot of things that you can do with uh, dill. Uh, this is one like a lot of them I have noted, but this is another one where this plant is a sea as an herb and a spice. Um, it attracts a lot of beneficial insects too. And uh, like I said, uh, it is a, a must if you do canning. Stevia has been around for a long time, but uh, usually you can only grow it from seed, but I'm starting to see it uh, in established plants now. I think I saw it at Lowe's this year. Uh, this plant uh, likes to have a lot of space. Uh, so um, you don't use less than a 12 inch pot. Uh, in, uh, no, uh, in the garden, it's got to be at least 18 inches apart. It's 30 times sweeter than sugar. And so I gave some of these leaves to my friends to, st uh, to uh, do a little taste test. And they said they rubbed it between their fingers and the smell, the aroma was very sweet. And it didn't have a, a aftertaste. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, it is another one, if you research or look at a tag, lots of times it says perennial, but it's not a perennial here. It's only a perennial in 810. Parsley, technically your biannual, but we all usually grow it as an annual. It's slow to germinate, so people usually buy this as an uh, established plant also. 
Uh, but the germination rate is pretty good on that. So I would attempt to do it from seed. Flat leaf and curly leaf. We use the flat leaf mostly in our cooking. It has a bolder taste. Our curly leaf is more of a um, garnish, but I like to use it in my winter pots with my pansies. If you've been watching the cooking stations a lot lately, you will find that they are talking about these bouquet garnies. And what they are is they are bundles of fresh herbs and um, they use them in stocks and soups. Um, they add uh, a lot of flavor, the uh, infuses into, the, um, into your stocks and uh, smells really, really good when you're cooking them. I don't think you can have chicken soup without parsley. Uh, you can also make uh, these bouquet, bouquet garnies out of dried. Um, what you do is you, um, there's this different recipes you can uh, find on the internet how to do this. And um, then you would put them in some cheesecloth and tie them. They make a nice, unique little gift for somebody too. And again, like so many of our soft leaf herbs, that black swallowtail butterfly caterpillar loves this plant. Let's talk about a few perennials. Uh, I like lovage. It's a member of the parsley family. It has a stronger, maybe peppery more taste than celery. Uh, I got familiar with this uh, when I lived in Western New York. I think it's one of the most shade tolerant herbs. I had it in the back of one of my uh, partial shade flower gardens and it came up year after year and looked great. Um, somewhere when I was researching, I always like to research a lot of my plants, be the, their history, especially herbs before I plant them. I found that the uh, Iroquois Indians uh, used to use these, they were in our area, used to use these for straws. So you can see the stems over there. They come in various uh, widths, but they're hollow. So I would do this with the kids and they would cut the stems and use them for straws. So it's a fun project to do with your kids. Um, these again are herbs and spice, depending on what part of the plant that you uh, use. I think oregano probably has the biggest zone area that I know of. I think it goes probably from four to at least 10. Uh, it would withstand a snowstorm in Western New York and it would just come up every year, just looking great. Um, you can see a picture. I have some on the pot over there that is uh, Italian uh, uh, oregano. And then in the bottom over here, it's a spicy oregano. Uh, it is a variety called hot and spicy. If you haven't uh, tried this one, try it. It's really, really good in salsa. And it's really good if you want to add a little pizzazz to your tomato sauce. And it also makes a great uh, bouquet garni. Oregano makes a great substitute uh, for uh, even basil. So um, you might wanna think about that too. Yes, there is even an ornamental oregano and it's called Barbara Tingy. And it uh, grows well inside. You start it from seed cuttings. I should have put in here from division two. I divided mine and had one hanging basket of this and I divided it in the spring and now I have two and I love it. Blooms all summer. It uh, uh, dries well. It doesn't really have that intense pink color, but it still dries well. I think the flowers look like hops. They start with this lime green and then they go into this beautiful little rose color. Uh, so it's a really nice one. Look for this one. This is a very interesting uh, one to put in your flower pots. Time. Bees go gaga over time. Uh, so if you want to put this in a uh, in a, uh, let's say in a hanging basket, or maybe you wanna put it in with your flower pot as the spiller looks fantastic, as well as in your herb, herb garden or your vegetable garden. Uh, this is one that we wanna make sure we trim this back. The leaves are very small on this plant and the oils is what make these plants uh, get their uh, taste and their aromas from. And uh, so if this plant becomes woody, we don't get uh, any new stems, no new leaves. And so uh, we need to keep this trimmed back. But it's still, uh, I like to tell people that, that we place it about every three years, especially if you're using it for culinary purposes. Um, I think uh, you get the better intense flavors if you do that. After a while, it just kind of, I don't know, just kind of goes away. Um, I like orange thyme. Um, I had that in my citrus uh, container over in the beginning. Uh, I had lemon and orange. I like orange because uh, I think thyme sometimes has it's an aftertaste and uh, this orange does not. It just keeps that orange taste on your palate all through it. Again, uh, this is thyme is a great one to
to use for substitute for basil, a substitute for oregano. Uh, thyme is a very good plant. Lavender, we probably all know about lavender. Uh, it demands full sun. Uh, I think we all love the smell. Not everybody, some people are allergic to it. And it is uh, one that needs very well-drained soil. If you overwater this plant, it's gonna die on you uh, very, very quickly. Um, I found it interesting that it likes its pH even up to eight. It again is, it needs it that annual pruning. We do not want it to become woody because then we're not gonna get all the stems with the flowers. There's two, there's English lavender and French lavender. English lavender is sweeter, has a shorter stem, and that's the one they use in, cook, in cooking. Uh, they make cookies out of it. They can put it in cakes. They can put it in iced tea. They can put it in lemonade. A lot of uh, reasons that you can use it for cooking. French lavender, you can see here, I made some uh, wreaths and some bundles of, uh, I think it was Grosso, uh, and they, for my flower projects. Uh, French lavender is very cold resistant, but is also more resistant to hot, humid weather also. And uh, it has longer stems, so it's easier to work with when you're uh, making projects like I did. I like uh, for down here, Grosso and Phenomenal. Chives, I wanted to talk about chives because chives is one that if you're gonna start a plant inside, uh, chives is a great one. It's pretty forgiving with uh, water requirements and lighting requirements. Um, and you need a couple years to harvest, get a big harvest out of this plant. Uh, not to say that you can't harvest it from um, a small plant, but to, if you wanna do a lot with it, like freeze it and some other things, uh, you need to, to wait a couple years. Um, it will grow in part sun as well as full sun. Uh, great companion plant, tomatoes, carrots, and lettuce. Why not? It's like making a salad. Uh, I wanted to point out the two different chives. There's onion chives and garlic chives. We probably more know onion chives or common chives. That has a flat hollow leaf, and that is the um, the onion chives uh, has a. This is backwards here. I don't know why, but all of a sudden this is backwards. So we have to change this. The onion chives has a, um, not a flat life. The garlic chives has a flat leaf with white flowers. Your onion chives has a rounded leaf, okay? And that has a, a pink to lavender flowers. That's how you tell them the difference. The garlic chives, it's, um, it's more like, the leaf is more like um, grass. Uh, so that's how you tell them the difference. Uh, sage. Uh, sage is a plant that is hard to kill. About the only way you can kill sage is if you overwater it. It will root rot on you very quickly. But I like tricolor sage. I like it so much better than garden sage because it's compact and I think it's more attractive. It starts out, the leaves start out with this uh, purple color and then they go into a green and white color. Um, they are great uh, substitute for, like I said, for garden sage, nice garnish. Uh, so uh, looks great in uh, flower pots, in your flower garden, in your herb garden. Uh, I just, uh, I like it so much better in garden sage. So what do we grow together? Uh, well, you can grow some that like the drier and sandier soil together. You can see uh, examples up here. And then you might want some that like uh, soil, a little less of that hot afternoon sun and moisture soil. And there's uh, some there like your cilantro and basil. I tell people to grow what they think they're gonna use. The purpose is to use these herbs. So grow together what you think you're gonna use. And then you can gradually grow more and more and you'll see what more and more you can grow together. When do we harvest the herbs? The best time to harvest is in the morning after the dew is dried off, but before that hot afternoon sun, which will dissipate the oils in a lot of these herbs. Uh, we also want to make sure um, if we are planting these herbs that we uh, uh, do them before they flower. Um, if we remove the flower bed, but uh, it is said to uh, uh, help them from not getting bitter. If they flower, they tend to get bitter. Um, also, um, up here, it should say uh, that we should harvest them, uh, that we should water them the day before they harvest, uh, we harvest them. Um, in this weather, you don't have any problem because you're watering them every day, but uh, herbs that are stressed, don't taste, uh, don't, they don't taste as well as herbs that are unstressed. And so we try to water them the day before we harvest them. 
Uh, when harvesting, we don't pick more than one third of the plant at a time. Uh, that is because um, we don't want the plant to get stressed out again. A general rule is that herbs can be harvested at eight inches and uh, perennials at six inches. Um, you can, uh, I, I like to tell people to stop harvesting their perennials about three weeks before the first frost. Uh, that way they're not continuing to grow. They're trying to uh, go to sleep, wind down for, for winter. How do we harvest herbs? Well, there's a lot of different ways to harvest them. Um, uh, long stem perennials like oregano, uh, you can cut the, the stem near the base uh, and you can cut some of the uh, older stems, if, especially if you wanna use them for skewers. But you can also take uh, uh, and do that, uh, some of the tips and you would cut just above a set of leaves. Uh, every time you do that, you'll get two new sets of leaves and that's gonna just cause it to branch out more. Then we're gonna get more production and that's what we want from these plants. Oregano is the same way. You can see oregano plant over here and you would cut above uh, the leaf node too to make that plant bushier. Leafy perennials like thyme, sage, and tarragon, you can harvest those by cutting three to four inches above the base of the plant, but you can also cut those off the tip. Um, I'm gonna tell you right now that thyme, we talked about how little that leaf has on there and you'll see recipes that say a few sprigs. Uh, well, you, three is not gonna be enough. Uh, you're going to have to probably do at least five or six. Those leaves are so tiny, and when you take them off uh, that stem, uh, you're going to need uh, more than three to even probably get a teaspoon of this to use in your cooking. Our cut and come again herbs, um, those are our leafy herbs like basil, uh, cilantro, parsley, marjoram. They like to be cut from the top, uh, except for two, I'm going to tell you, uh, because every time uh, we cut them from the top, uh, we are also causing them to uh, branch out more. And the more leaves we get, the more production and the more use we get from that plant. Parsley and cilantro like to be cut from the inside, from the outside in. The plant grows uh, from that inside. So we, we start with the leaves on the outside, more mature leaves, and we cut inside. Um, that keeps that plant growing. Uh, we don't want to take the uh, middle of that plant out. Pruning and harvesting. Uh, both are done by pinching and cutting pieces of the plant, uh, but we often use them interchangeably, but and herbs, especially for herbs, and I probably did today a little bit, but there is a difference. Uh, when we prune the, uh, plants, we are removing parts to improve the production. Like when we do the basil, um, we are, every time we cut above uh, that stem, above a leaf node, uh, when we're harvesting and pruning, we're gonna get two new uh, stems from that plant. So it makes it bushier, like I said, and uh, we also wanna take the dead pieces uh, out of our plants too. When we're harvesting, we only remove the parts that we're gonna use that day. We don't want to take more than a third of the plant and we only want what we can eat, dry, or use in a bouquet, especially for eating. These herbs taste better fresh. Uh, yes, uh, you can put some in the refrigerator, uh, but they lose their flavor. Basil, you cannot put in the refrigerator. It will turn black on you. And um, parsley is a good one that you can bring inside and put at room temperature in a glass of water, but they lose their flavor over uh, the days. So the best thing is to just, just harvest what you're gonna use that day. How do we preserve our, our herbs? Well, drying herbs is probably the best because they uh, can use them for a longer period of time as long as we put them in airtight jars. I like to use canning jars, they work pretty good. And there's three ways you can do it, microwave oven or air drying. I don't like microwave too well uh, because especially like uh, thyme with that small leaf, uh, you can dry it too quickly and then you're gonna destroy all the flavor of that herb, but people do it and you can find the directions for it. Uh, oven is another way. Uh, you can use your oven at 180. If you can set it to 110, all the better. Uh, you can use the open the door periodically or leave it ajar the whole time, but you have to constantly stir them and make sure that they don't burn. So most of us will do, it's the most popular and easiest way is to harvest and clean our herbs and hang them in small bunches in a warm, well-ventilated area. The leaves will dry in a couple of weeks. Um, you can buy uh, uh, these herbal racks and do them inside, or you can hang them from uh, 
a string across maybe a top of a window that doesn't get the really harsh uh, light. Or um, I've even grown some on, um, on those wire, um, uh, hung them on those wire uh, coat hangers and, hang, and hung, it, hung it from like a uh, curtain rod. Uh, but uh, you can also do it in a garage or your attic or barn. I've done, I think you should probably put them in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a bag, you know, in a paper bag with some slits on the side so you have ventilation. And uh, that keeps the contaminants like your dust and stuff off of them while they're drying. Make sure that it's not hanging in an area that gets a lot of light on it because then you'll just have all those oils dissipate inside that, uh, inside that bag. My favorite way to do it is in my dehydrator and I have an Excalibur, uh, Excalibur hydrator and I do all my herbs in there, basil, oregano and tarragon. Uh, mine, I set at 90 to 100, I think is the setting, but they probably all come with different settings. So you have to look at your instructions, but you know they're done when they crumble easily. You can also do them with freezing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have tried uh, basil and cilantro this way and you can also uh, do uh, parsley this way and chives. Uh, you can just, uh, with your basil and cilantro, you've made pesto and you've just put a little water and oil and uh, you put it in a food processor and then you uh, get that mixture and put it in ice cube trays. Now for all of you that are gonna say, I don't have ice cube trays. Well, you can get them at the dollar store. It's down in a quarter now though, but you can uh, do that and then pop them out of that ice cube tray. You don't have to leave it in there constantly and put them in their own individual bags so that you can use them all year to use in uh, pestos or to use um, in your stocks or if you're making soup, uh, all those different ways. You can also take chives and blanch it and then uh, get yourself a cookie sheet and put some parchment paper on it and freeze it and then take it out and put them in their individual bags also. We wanna store all our dried herbs in glass or plastic containers. You can see I did that over here on the side and put them in a dark cabinet or drawer. Make sure you label them though, because once they're dried, I'm gonna tell you these leaves, uh, they all look alike. Um, I think some herbs are better dried than fresh, like dill, thyme, and sage. And then some are better fresh, I think, than dried. Uh, but you can start experimenting, growing these herbs, drying them, freezing them, see which way you like them best. And uh, you'll get uh, uh, familiar with them. You'll find what you wanna use them for. Uh, I wanted to just share this with you quickly. Um, if you find a recipe that uh, says you need a tablespoon of fresh, it's winter, you don't have any fresh, but you got dried, it's a uh, one to three ratio. In other words, one tablespoon of fresh equals one teaspoon of dried. Uh, that's a little math we have to do in our head. And uh, you can carry it a little bit farther and because uh, ground is more even potent than dried. And so one tablespoon of fresh, if we do our math right, would be one half teaspoon of ground. So we've gone over a lot today. I could have spent maybe 30 minutes on just some of these uh, um, areas all by themselves. Uh, but now if you have any questions, I'll try to answer all your questions. Thanks for listening. Am I done? leaves when propagating. Ron answered that. What did he say? Uh, the question was, how do you remove leaves when propagating? He said, use sharp, clean knife uh -huh. and gently remove the leaves. The stem of the plant may not scar the stem. So yeah, it looks like any of our questions we, we had answered there. Okay. I'm not on anymore, am I? <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> Hey, Linda. Hey, Woody. How fresh are the herbs that you buy in the store that's in those little containers? Um, you mean the ones that with the cuttings? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those uh, clam ones that I talked about? Yeah. Yeah. Those? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I don't know, but I've taken them and I've um, used them and, and uh, made cuttings from them. So I guess they must be pretty good, but they wouldn't. Uh, 
Yeah. It wouldn't take. Yeah. It's a good idea on cuttings. I normally buy them for herbs themselves, but I've never, yeah. never did the cuttings. Great idea. Yeah. All right. Well, if we have no more questions, thank you, Linda, very much for sharing your time and talent with us. Um, and hope it was informative to everybody. So thank you. You wasn't stupid, was it?